The Rev Fourth Rhombectomy uh, is part of that toolkit for dealing with uh, gene stent occlusion, uh, and it has to be used with a couple other parts of the toolkit that we're going to talk about. Um, it is single use. It is sterile. It can go through a 12 French sheath, um, but uh, you know, I generally tend to prefer a 13 French sheath or a, a 16 French sheath when working with the device. Um, I've used it from the internal jugular vein, from the popliteal vein. Its length really supports usage uh, from a variety of access sites, uh, and it's really designed to deal with the material that gathers within the stent. Um, and so I'll show a case where it was uh, applied. And one other thing I would point out about it is that it is variable in size. So when we talked, when we talked at the start of the session, you have a lot of control over how big that pouring element becomes, see how it works in the body and how a, a patient uh, does. And we're going to start back with that 47 year old woman. So the stent in question had been known to be occluded for six years. And it was originally placed for a, a, a DDT and a Maytherner lesion. Um, the patient underwent two subsequent thrombolysis events at an outside institution, and ultimately was told there was nothing else that could be done uh, to maintain that stent patency. And so she had a very good inflow uh, for the most part. There's some post-thrombotic disease that you can see in the femoral popliteal segment there. Uh, there is flow coming in from the profunda, and she has those very large, tortuous, almost bulbous looking collateral uh, coming out of the common femoral vein. So the first part of your rev core case is gonna be exactly what I showed here, and that's your popliteal access or your integrate access, should you choose to have it, in order to perform the RevCore procedure. Uh, and really, I found it efficacious to get the access that you were going to use to cross first, because before you opened all the devices uh, and, and, and spent all that money, um, one of the things that you wanted to do is make sure that you actually cross the lesion and give yourself a chance to actually have a, a successful outcome. So this is that same patient. Um, I'm not gonna show all the things that we did to cross, uh, but uh, needless to say, it took about 30 minutes to cross this chronically occluded stent. Once our wire was across, I uh, also got contralateral access. And the reason in this case was that, you know, with RevCore, you are generating material as you use the device within the stent. Uh, and I find that it's very, it was very nice to use the protrieve sheath. Uh, to capture that material in the IVC so I can analyze it and aspirate it from the body. Uh, having contralateral access for my first case was really helpful in allowing me to visualize flow in the protrude sheath. And I was worried at that point that um, if the stent remained occluded, I wouldn't really be able to visualize what was happening in the IVC. And additionally, if I had to extend my stent into the IVC, I had access so I could create kissing stents or a two-in-one stent as well. So the next part of this case, a uh, highlight, we did our ascending venogram, we crossed our lesion, and the next thing to do is get all your additional access. So in this case, it was the contralateral saphenous vein, and we also got IJ access as well, so we could place a protrieve sheath in the IVC. Uh, once we did that, uh, we've crossed the lesion, we placed our protrieve, the next thing to do is dilate the track. Uh, and, you know, this is after I would point out that I snared the wire through and through the protrieve sheath. Really, for my first couple of cases, I wanted to have that additional control, that additional pushability. Um, ultimately, I don't really think I needed it, but it made me feel more comfortable as I was getting used to this, this new device. Um, but the key step here is in the first pass, as we talked about kind of that, um, that you know, that thin cheese grater slice that peels off those nice thin, there's a cheese knife, someone's gonna know the name of it, those nice thin layers of cheese. That's how I imagine the RevCore functioning. And so you really wanna create a pathway for the RevCore device to enter into the stent and then deploy. So ballooning that track for the first time is really important. Uh, in general, we I, I chose a four or a six millimeter balloon and then dilated with an eight millimeter balloon. Uh, and this is that balloon path taking shape. Afterwards, we then unsheathe the device. So this is our first unsheathing. And then to make sure that the device passes smoothly through the stent, because you are going to be moving the device aggressively, like as I said, back and forth and revving back and forth, uh, you're going to find that you want to make sure that you can pass the device smoothly in its unsheathed fashion. So this is a pullback and an advancement unsheathed to make sure the device passes. And the next step is to begin revving. Um, and so it's not, as I said before, it's not those little cups chunking out parts of the material that's in the stent. 
really it's this shaving mechanism or almost you can think like a grinding or a polishing mechanism. And so what you want to do is you don't crank it all the way up to 20 millimeters the first time. Uh, you go to the half mark and you rev back and forth. You proceed from proximal to distal or distal proximally. And then you can withdraw the device, inspect it as you reshoot this, see if there's any material on the, the coring element uh, and put it back in the body. And again, then go back at one notch higher of a diameter. And you wanna go until there's resistance, you pass all the way through when there's not, um, and then you keep moving back and forth. Um, and so, Again, I took a picture here, uh, and what I started to see is that there is material that's generated uh, in the middle of the case. And it goes to this stuff that we did take out of the body, which are these sheaths-like material uh, and a little bit of chunks, but not big pieces like you would expect to be peeling off. Again, it's more like, a, um, I would say, like, a, like, like thin sheets that are being, again, like that cheese slice coming off. Uh, and you see it gathering at the distal margin of the stent and up in the protrude sheet. So we continued to work um, and it did generate more material. And so one thing I would remind you to do is continue to aspirate. Um, I, I learned pretty quickly that uh, continual aspiration from the protrieve sheath was very beneficial. Uh, uh, and I would I'd say, I should have said from the start, I did do this on full dose anticoagulation. The patient was on Xeralto and did not stop the medication for the procedure. Uh, and then I was continually aspirating material through the protrieve sheath to prevent what I would worry about, which would be lining of the protrieve and then you know, uh, stasis in the IVC. And then we continued to work. And this is after about, I'd say, five to 10 minutes of revving back and forth. We've made really good progress in terms of our lumen. Uh, and at this point, I performed intravascular ultrasound. I really wanted to see what type of material remained in the stent lumen and what areas I had to focus on. Uh, and the venogram was helpful in that. When you look near the cable confluence, you do see that there's a higher level of stenotic material, of thrombotic material leading to stenosis on the venogram. But it was able to show me that I had to spend a lot more time in our proximal inflow segment and uh, really address some of the material that had gathered that looked irregular around the lumen. It's hard. Uh, and, and one of the things I would say is because we don't know for certain what a significant stenosis is in terms of thrombus that relines these stents, um, you know, in doing the RevCore case, it was a goal for gold. Uh, we had a tool available and to continue to, to work on that material, I felt was in the best interest of maintaining patency. Uh, so continue to rev. And in this location, I'm working both for uh, a couple rotations in the clockwise direction, rotating backwards in a counterclockwise uh, direction. And then you'll see at the end, I'm, I'm trying to do a flip up uh, as I try and uh, work on the material that I felt was stuck on the end of the stent. And this is after a little bit more work has been done. Uh, we see that there is a, all the material that was on the end of the stent previously has been mobilized. There is very limited material or irregularities left in the majority of the iliac stent. Uh, and I've been continually aspirating that material out, but you can see some material still residually left within the protrieve sheet that we continued to aspirate as part of our procedure. And so ultimately, uh, I thought we had a great result. This is our completion very brisk flow. Uh, we did do an IVUS and I did not feel like it was necessary to extend the stent. We had an excellent uh, stent to, to vein sizing. Um, we had uh, essentially no real visible rind or lumen left inside of the stent itself and brisk emptying through the cave up. So uh, all in all, I, I think the procedure probably with crossing ended up taking about 90 minutes. Um, we were revving for probably about 30 of those minutes and uh, it definitely was able to restore flow in a stent that had been included for a, at least six years. Um, and I think one of the exciting things about this case after our completion of uh, and that was just showing the inflow segment, is that I've seen the patient back in follow-up, and this is about her one-month follow-up CT venogram. Uh, the patient has reported complete resolution of her symptoms, and on the CT venogram, which I got uh, just out of curiosity to make sure there was no stent fracture, to make sure that the inflow segment looked patent, uh, I see that there is a widely patent stent uh, with some of those additional collaterals that we saw before that we may consider uh, uh, sclerosing. Uh, and we also had an ultrasound that showed great respiratory variation in a widely 
a patent vessel as well.